Welcome to One Mind Brainwaves. I'm your host, Brandon Staglin. Brain, Brainwaves is a show where we talk with leaders who are making waves for brain health. Today's topic is the science of the female and male brains, an often controversial topic of study. Are the two brains different? And are they different physically? Do they function differently? And uh, are, are the changes that are between the two brains, are they hardwired or are they malleable? We're gonna find out today about how these brains relate and some are similar and different and how they relate to common mental health conditions. We're gonna talk with two leaders who have studied both brains extensively, who have uh, are leaders in that field, uh, Dr. Ner Dr. Rita Valentino, who is this neuroscientist at the a National Institute of Drug Abuse and neuropsychiatrist and author, Dr. Luann Brizendine. And singer songwriter, Anthony Aria will give a playful take on something that we believe is tr true about the differences between male and female brains and some might agree. Uh, but first a story. So I believe that there are, uh, there's no value to stereotypes uh, between male and female brains in terms of um, how men are different from women uh, in terms of capabilities and proclivities. Uh, I racked my brain over the last week to try and think of a story that would illustrate um, how I've experienced differences between male and female abilities and, and, and uh, characteristics. But thinking about it, I realized that uh, the differences are, are, are not um, anything we can generalize. So for example, uh, there's a stereotype that men are more analytical and women are more emotional. Um, in my experience, it doesn't fit with that. So all the leaders who I know from my peer group, from my master's program at UCSF to my current organization that I work with, One Mind, uh, the leaders who are women are more, uh, are the most um, organized and uh, together and level-headed of anyone that I know. And I admire them for that. So in order to and make sure that women have the, um, the status and recognition they deserve in our society in which they're terribly underrepresented uh, in terms of leadership. Uh, I think it's important that we learn from reality and the facts. So it's great that we have these leaders with us today in neuroscience and neuropsychiatry to talk with us about the science of the male and female brains and gender differences or similarities. <music> Joining us now is a talented young artist who appeared as a contestant on NBC's The Voice at the age of 15. We're so pleased to have him here as a performer on today's show. He's going to perform the favorite Calypso song, Man Smart, Woman Smarter. Singer, songwriter, and guitarist, Anthony Aria, thanks so much for being on Brainwaves today. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so excited to have you here. Awesome. Uh, you know, uh, how are you doing there in Santa Cruz today? Doing, doing as well as could be, you know, it's been a crazy couple months, uh, especially in Santa Cruz that we just had the CZU fires. So it has been uh, a little hectic here in Santa Cruz for, you know, this, this summer and going into fall. So, but yeah, hanging in there. <laughs> Good. Glad you're, glad you're doing okay. Despite all the challenges we've experienced them out here in the Napa Valley too, in the North Bay uh, with the fires yeah. and everything. So, yeah, it's challenging for all, all of our country in many different ways right now uh, for people to cope. Um, but, uh, to, to manage possibly to manage that, but also to help other people, uh, enjoy their lives more. You're a great and talented singer songwriter, and you've already released two albums. Uh, you're a student at Stanford, uh, and you've received, uh, recognition as a U.S. presidential scholar in the arts, which is a prestigious award recognizing the nation's top students in visual and performing arts. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. You, you bet, but uh, give us a bit of the history. Um, when did you first meet a guitar and how did you get so interested in performing music? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, well, I kind of, all kind of started in elementary school. I, I joined my after school rock band and I was playing drums and singing and uh, that's what kind of really got me into performing. Um, shortly after I picked up the guitar and it kind of just went off from there. I have uh, I've had a great guitar teacher since I first started playing, and I really became just invested in that instrument. Um, and going into middle school, they didn't have a um, they didn't have a rock band, so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll join the jazz band. And I started learning jazz guitar and started singing jazz um, jazz in this band, and um, it all kind of just progressed 
throughout high school, I joined the um, the choir program at my high school here in, in Santa Cruz, and it, that was really my first uh, vocal training. Um, so I got more and more involved, and 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 then about four years ago, I started writing my own music. Um, you know, I'm I'm not totally sure what was the um, really the catalyst for that, but I, I think a combination of jazz and the whole you know, creative, creativeness of, of, you know, and freedom of jazz music really inspired me to start writing music. And I, I would play anywhere and everywhere that they, you know, would listen to me. I would busk on the streets in San Francisco and North Beach. I would, I would play for family and friends for school performances. And so, you know, as I performed more and more, I just got more and more interested in playing my music for other people. And in 2018, in the summer of 2018, I found myself on NBC's The Voice for season 15. So it's been a roller coaster. I uh, came back and like you mentioned, I put out two albums um, and I've just been playing you know, hundreds of shows around the Bay Area. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. Congratulations on all the success and the recognition. Uh, your music is beautiful. I've been listening to it. Uh, and oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, your songs actually, they can be very philosophical, like your uh, 2020 graduation song, which is on yeah, YouTube, yeah. example. What inspires you to write your songs? Yeah, well, you know, that song was for my um, graduation. I was, instead of just, you know, writing a long valedictorian speech, I was like, I think they'd rather hear me sing. So I ended up writing a song for, that was just about the times with 2020. But I like inspiration for songs, I think, come from everything that I experience. I, I always it's really nice to have a phone around where you can write down notes and, and melodies and, uh, you know, from conversations to experiences to um, the things that I'm, you know, seeing uh, around me on the news or whatnot. It it, uh, it always kind of inspires music. And um, it's been interesting to see how how the music the content, you know, the, the, the content and also the sound has changed, evolved over uh, time as I've been writing music. Interesting. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you're growing with the music as, as things evolve around you and within you. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool to, to hear about. Um, so man, smart women, smarter has been recorded by artists ranging from Joan Baez to Harry Belafonte to Roseanne Cash, even the fictional uh, Marge and Homer Simpson have given it a go. Yeah. Uh, how did you discover this whimsical song? Yeah, it was kind of a, a funny thing because I have uh, the the Grateful Dead version. I have a Grateful Dead band and one of my bands here in Santa Cruz, and and that is kind of the most popular version, at least in Santa Cruz. But I didn't hear that version first. I was uh, listening to the radio in the car, and um, an artist named Robert Palmer came on the radio with a song called Spanish Moon, and I shazammed it because yeah, if I hear a song I like, I got to shazam it to see what it is. And I was listening to that album, and the track before was called Man Smart, Women Smarter. And so I, I started listening to that tune. And then um, as I was getting my Grateful Dead band together for building a big repertoire of, of Grateful Dead songs, I stumbled upon that song in their version. So it's kind of an interesting story on that one, but I love that song, and yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I love the theme and uh, how true it is uh, in many cases. So uh, um, can you please uh, perform this great song for us today? Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear it. the man in a puppet show it ain't me it's the people that say men are leading the women astray and i say it's the women today smarter than the man in every way well that's right the women are smarter that's right the women are smarter that's right the women are smarter the women are smarter that's right that's right the women today smarter than the 
man in every way Well that's right, the women are smarter That's right, the women are smarter That's right, the women are smarter The women are smarter, that's right, that's right Forward to that song and it's it's it is no crew. No, thank you <laughs> yeah th thanks for calling out the smartness of women and uh we have two uh, amazingly smart women here with us today to to tell us about uh, what they know um so anthony thank you so much for your wonderful performance and uh, uh appreciate you being on brainwaves today hope you'll stay with us for a little bit of the show as well oh yeah thanks for having me you bet thank you thanks anthony thanks <laughs> Here now to talk with us about the science of the female and male brains, their differences and similarities are Dr. Luann Brizendine, a professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco. She's also the author of The Female Brain, as well as, as which is a 2006 bestseller, as well as the 2010 The Male Brain, which is a break, uh, the subtitle of Breakthrough Understanding of How Men and Boys Think and Dr. Rita Valentino, the Director of the Division of Neuroscience and Behavior at the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. Luann, thank you so much for being on Brainwaves today. Well, my Rita. pleasure. It's great to be here. And boy, I'll tell you, Anthony got to start it off with a very high bar here. We got to like, you know, right, Rita? We got to have to hit the bar. And with Elvis in the background. This I know, <laughs> and also notice Yoko and uh, John, I noticed. Uh, <laughs> That's there. right. This is kind of my wall of idols here. Right, yeah. Talking about male and female brain, Joko and John are a very interesting combo. Right? I know. And I also want to add to that's my mom's favorite song, man. It's my women smart of the dead. I, oh. I, I've grown up in a strong matriarchy. I was raised by my mom and my grandma. So yeah, I love that song. Thumbs up to your mom. <laughs> yeah. And Rita, thank you as well for being on Brainwaves today. You're going to bring a lot of... Uh, my pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so Luann, let's uh, start with you. Uh, how are things in San Francisco today? Actually, I'm in Sausalito, so we're in Marin County, and actually it's a very beautiful, clear day on the water, and there's sailboats and everything out here, so it's looking, it's looking good. It's a very calm, beautiful day, so report, reporting in from Sausalito. <laughs> right, love to hear that. So let's talk about the female and male brain. So um, first of all, the anatomical differences. Um, we, we know that male brains are on average larger than women's brains because male, male's body, men's bodies are larger than women's bodies in general. Uh, are parts, all parts of their brains larger than women's brains? Do they function differently? So let me give a little bit just in a nutshell right here. Let's just start off with the fact that really important to remember that male and female brains are more alike than different. After all, we are the same species, okay? Just so we got that one down. And you know, at the moment of conception, when the, when the sperm enters the egg, if the sperm is carrying a Y, you're gonna have the male, and if it's carrying an X, you're gonna end up with female. And let's say the, the Y has gone in, it's going to be male, and about eight weeks of fetal life, 
the tiny testicles start to pump out huge amounts of testosterone, almost at the adult male level, and marinates the body and the brain, and it changes many of the parts of the body and brain to male. The female, on the other hand, is through the, out the whole nine months, she is unperturbed by testosterone. So there's, she develops in the female model. That's why sometimes it's called the default model is female because there's not the perturbation of testosterone. But so for you guys, you're gonna be having all that marination of your body and brain, changing all of that into male brain, into male body. So at the time of birth, we're either born with typically the male version of the body and brain or the female version of the body and brain. Now that, that starts us off all at birth with that kind of laying down of many, many circuits, you know, the genitals or end up male or female. So all the things that we know kind of have happened during that nine months. It's important to remember that's all kind of like formed at that point. And then of course, the first 12 months of a boy's life, of a baby's life, he has almost adult males of testosterone still pumping out from his testicles. And then for the first time, girls start to have huge amounts, almost adult female levels of estrogen coming out of her ovaries for the first couple of years. We call that time infantile puberty. So interestingly enough, by about two or three years old, we are kind of laid down as we're supposed to be with all of the hormonal and genetic parts of the body and brain. At that point, of course, starts all the really profound, important parts of how the, the culture, how people react to you, what, you know, all of that part. If you talk to biologists versus psychologists, they think the, the nature nurture debate is a bit dead at this point because 50% probably comes from how you're raised in terms of your gender and 50% from your hormones and genes. So that's a really important point to remember. So that's that's how we all get laid down in the basics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's fascinating, Luann. So it's it's like, it's not it's not all just the brain that affects our behavior, but it's the whole body that that um, differentiates uh, the how brains develop in, in both men and women throughout their lives. Yeah, yeah. so that's, it's important to just, then everything we're gonna talk about is kind of built up on that basic, building, architectural building of the, of the foundation. So there you have it in a nutshell. Interesting, okay. Um, so thank you for that uh, exposition uh, we, uh, and how sex hormones play into that, that uh, development of the male and female brains. That's really fascinating too. Um, Rita, let's turn to you please for a moment. Um, your research is focused on hormone responses to stress. We know that stress and anxiety disorders affect females at higher rates than they affect males. Uh, but why is that? So I think first it's important to understand the stress response. And um, uh, you know, oftentimes we think, oh, stress is bad, but the stress response really is an adaptive response that's important for survival. And, it, and it's composed of sort of, uh, uh, an engagement of multiple systems, so the cardiovascular system, uh, the GI tracts, so all this, the, the whole sympathetic nervous systems turned on. You have arousal systems in the brain that are turned on. You have behavioral changes. You have immune changes, and these uh, kind of all go on simultaneously to deal with the life-threatening challenge. And so that's very important to survival. But when this becomes pathologic, or what makes it pathologic? is if these are turned on inappropriately by something that we, we may perceive as life-threatening, but it's not life-threatening or it's a sub-threshold for that, or when the response continues to go on, when it's not shut off after the stressor is terminated. And then the ongoing activity of all these systems takes a toll on those systems. So you, you would end up with increased uh, blood pressure, metabolic changes that can lead to diabetes, um, sleep disorders because of hyperarousal, anxiety-like symptoms because uh, of the behavioral and cognitive changes. So, so that's kind of the pathological aspect of stress. And that's why you often see um, comorbid kind of meta in stress-related disorders, uh, anxiety or PTSD, you often see sort of a comorbid um, cardiovascular disease or metabolic disorders that, that are often comorbid with those. So um, what our research, our research has focused on um, 
a hormone that's really orchestrates the stress response called corticotropin releasing factor, which uh, really initiates that uh, the hallmark of stress, ACTH release and, and corticosteroid release, but it also engages many systems in the brain that are activated by, by stressors and particularly the brain norepinephrine system. This is an important arousal system. It, it, it's what, uh, uh, it, it's very important for stress elicited arousal. And so uh, we've studied the interaction between corticotropin releasing factor and these norepinephrine neurons. And uh, what we found is that in females, these cells are, are uh, show a higher level of activation to corticotropin releasing factor. So the same amount of corticotropin releasing factor would produce a greater amount of activation. And that's because the receptor or the protein with which CRF has to interact with to produce its response in these cells is um, shows a greater, uh, it's coupled better to its signaling molecule in females than it is in males. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's one reason. And then another sort of molecular basis for this greater response is that the response is not turned off as quickly. So when CRF binds to its receptor in cells, the receptor internalizes and that shuts off the response. It, it removes it from the cell membrane so it can interact with other, with CRF that's out there. So that does not happen, that internalization process does not happen as well or as efficiently in females compared to males. So you have a bigger response and it's not being turned off. So, um, so that, that adaptation to too much CRF is, is not there in females. So, so, uh, so, the, so they're more sensitive to stressors, particularly this norepinephrine system is more sensitive to stressors and that leads to hyperarousal, hypervigilance, cognitive effects, and, and, and many of the sort of arousal symptoms that you see in stress-related psychiatric disorders. Wow, so that's kind of the biological underpinnings of some of the differential response to stress in women versus versus men. And right. there, there are some Brenda, can I ask me a question? Sure. Um, yeah. I was just, you know, from the kind of the female perspective and the, 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 how the, how the system is modulated, it sounds like the stress response in the female system is modulated um, um, to be more robust and, you yes. know, to turn on and to turn off later. And um, so it's not, it's not one is normal and one is not. For some reason, female systems are just have a broader, they, they, they turn on and off at a, at a different timing than males. Males are kind of a, quick on and quick off, is that it? And females are, are, are it the females that just have the, the slower off signal? So, so yeah, so it's, so in females that receptor is not internalized. So that response would continue, yes. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's not, and one of the things I, I think you're pointing out is that it's, that's not necessarily bad. It's not, you know, that that's probably adaptive for maybe what the female has to do, but, where it becomes maladaptive is, is when there's too much CRF, when, which is thought to happen in certain um, psychiatric disorders like PTSD. And so, so then it's just gonna continue. So, so if the response is um, really much longer than, a, than an acute stress, so a repeated stress or a chronic stress, that's when it begins to take a toll, you think on gotcha. that. Uh, so that there's um so there's that factor for women to to know about, but also um, men are uh, overrepresent or disproportionately uh, susceptible to other conditions like um, um, uh, autism spectrum disorders, for example, or schizophrenia. Uh, and uh, what can research tell us about how, why this might be? Um, yeah, so so those disorders are are um, have more of a genetic basis than. Um, then, then the stress, it's really the stress-related psychiatric disorders that are more prevalent in females, with one exception that, that we can talk about, and that, that's uh, substance abuse. So substance abuse is, is related to stress, but it is more prevalent in males, although the characteristics are different. And, and in females, actually, uh, there is more of a stress-related component in substance abuse for females compared to males. 
Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Uh, Luann, do you have any perspective on why um, men are more susceptible to psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia or, or uh, neurodevelopmental conditions like autism? Well, I think there's probably a combination of the genetics that are laid down and of course of the, of the male, as you lay, lay down the, the male system with, with the testosterone in utero. And then of course, you know, about nine or 10 years old, the male testosterone starts to creep up. And by the time you're 15, your testosterone is like times 250 what it was at age nine or 10. So the curve goes, whoop, you know, straight up. And so male testosterone, that, that brings on all the sexual interest, the, you know, if you're gonna be same sex attracted, then you're attracted to the same sex, if you're opposite sex attracted, it's all, it all unfolds at that same time in males in the, you know, in the early teens about sexual attraction, about sexual interest. And so that there's something about that, that testosterone surge at that time that may give slight proclivity to, for example, schizophrenia in that 1.4 more times in males, slightly more in males, and also slightly earlier presentation in males may have something to do with the testosterone combination with the underlying genetics of schizophrenia. Autism, remember autism in boys, um, the lowest, it's four to one ratio in, in the people that have it low and some people have it up as far as 10, 10 to one ratio. So it's very much more robust and higher in males. And of course that starts at a much younger age, but remember they already had all of that in utero as a fetus had that big blast of testosterone then, then they had a big blast of testosterone in their first year of life too. So the thinking is that there's something about the genetics plus the testosterone surge that um, has something to do with making that ratio. Remember, learning disabilities is also something that's much more male too. So those, those are the sex ratios in that. And then the female part of the stress responsivity, stress. And so I always remember that, you know, they didn't know when I was, you know, first in this world in the 80s about why it was there was a two to one ratio in depression more than women and, and anxiety disorders, it's four to one more female. So, um, you know, so that's much more female. But the thing is in childhood, there's Brandon, there's a, four, there's a one to one ratio in depression in childhood, a one to one ratio in, in male, female in anxiety. Uh, and, and until you get to the menstrual cycle in Caucasian girls, average age of starting your period is 12. 0.1 in Caucasian and also um, in, in Hispanic girls. In African-American girls, it's about 11. In Asian girls, it's about 13. So there is some, some disparity there that, that um, isn't known exactly why. But so in that time frame, girls start that regular every month, you know, you ovulate, the estrogen goes up, progesterone comes on at ovulation. You get the waves of the hormones going through the month. And something about that hormonal stimulation seems to co correlate correlate with not not cause but correlate with the onset of anxiety depression and um, perhaps Rita can speak to it, you know hypothesis is that they're that's the stress response of this way that their their cortisol their stress hormones you know end up sending signals throughout the whole brain throughout the I guess the norepinephrine system whatever it is 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 going to just start at that time. They didn't have that those waves that made it more sensitive and the estrogen that made it more sensitive before that. So maybe Rita could sp speak to the onset of those things in females doesn't seem to happen for at least the diseases from the clinician's point until the um, menstrual cycle gets into to full full flower, shall we say, full flower. Yeah, no, I, I th that, that's true. I think that um, the hormones clearly are, are, are are playing a role in this. But you know, what's interesting is that when we looked at our changes in the CRF receptor, what, what struck us was regardless of the circulating hormonal status, females were more sensitive and that receptor was more sensitive. So what we were thinking is that perhaps it was, um, uh, an organizational thing that may, we were looking at, at adult animals and maybe it's an organist that the hormones are organizing that during adolescence. And then, uh, so, so they're producing the change in adolescence. And then, we're, you know, we were looking at this in adulthood and that, that, that the female hormones were necessary for that uh, 
uh, change in the receptor uh, uh, signaling. I know so many other things happen that we know about in the teen male brain, teen female brain. For example, they've done these, these very interesting studies where they'll put you in the brain scanner and they'll have males and females, teenage, you know, teenage years, when the hormones have gone way up in the males and the hormones have, are, are fluctuating in the females, having them look at faces mm. and um, say what kind of a, that, that males tend to see more anger in different kinds of facial expressions than, than are, they, they, they actually kind of have this illusion that like it, they actually see more aggression and more threat in faces during their teen years than they will they did they did in childhood or that they, they will in adulthood so there's this period of time when the the, the threat uh, the facial threat of of, of mo usually other males will look more threatening to males than they will to to the female brain in terms of responsivity so there's you know there's this obviously that's all kind mother nature made this made this beautiful choreography and how we respond to things to keep us alive. It's all about survival or else for females, it's help, it's survival and protecting helpless infants. You know, if you want to really look at what's different about males and females, it's like females are wired to, to not only reproduce and, and have the babies, but to, to protect. We have babies that are so helpless. They don't speak. We have to guess, females have to guess what the baby wants for the first tier, two years of life. So if there's any more emotional empathy, empathy tuning, it's in the service of females being able to read those nonverbal expressions in helpless nonverbal you know, infants, you know, until they get right. to be two or three years old. So of course we would be wired for that. Our great, 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 the most successful great, great, great grandmothers were all really good at this stuff. And that's why we're all here. They were really good at that. So it can, it just, you know, so, I mean, that, that may be a just so story, Rita, I don't know, but it's like, it's kind of one of those things about how, you know, how, how, how we're not only wired, but we're kind of, when we have those experiences, we become better at it. I mean, it's just like a musician, Anthony can tell you, it's like, you know, the more and more and more you practice, then the day that you have to like, boom, you have to do something, you know, your, your practicing pays off because you can do it. So the more we practice something, the females practice empathy towards helpless infants or towards others. And we get better and better and better at it. And just like, if you guys were the ones who had babies and had to, it, you know, I know that um, I've got a lot of friends who, you know, that are married to guys that are married to each other. They have, they adopt a child and they become really good at this. So a lot of it is, practice it's not just the issue of gender i don't but, know but, yeah but you do bring up there um you yeah. bring up a very important point about a sort of windows of development and how hormones interact with those windows i you know i just I, two examples of this i just read uh, this lovely paper by uh by peg mccarthy showing that uh testosterone in um uh in males in this very uh perinatal period uh, causes microglia to uh, to eat cells in the medial the medial amygdala okay and that this is important for initiating juvenile play behavior and, and in in rodents you know it's males that show a lot of this rough and tumble playing right and not the females in the same time period but if you give testosterone in the same brain region in females then they look like males and so, um, so it's the testosterone only in this period, right, is shaping this juvenile play behavior. And, and then the other thing that, that what you're saying as far as windows of, of development, um, this reminded me of is the maternal brain. So when you become pregnant, the brain changes and it changes in regions that are important for is in regions that we call the social brain, right? The social parts of the brain that are important in processing social information and creating uh, creating that bond, really, um, so that so that bond can be formed between the uh, the mother and, and the infant. And uh, these changes can last for for years after pregnancy. So it's really it's really remarkable how. And I think in that case, you know, oxytocin plays a big role. So it's really remarkable how um, the interaction of hormones, but really in particular times, um, are, are really uh, priming the brain for specific uh, behaviors. I know you say that last, how long it lasts. It's like my 30 year old son would say it lasts too long. He says, like, 
I'll like, you know, snip those apron strings, mom, <laughs> right? <laughs> but there are those things, you know, you do get that the, the um, because it's like, you, you know, that females who are, uh, once they've become pregnant and had a child, they, they test them to see how they, how much their brain activates when they pipe in crying babies right. and versus a male. To look at the male female brain and how much they're able their brain will activate to listening to the cry of a baby and you know even if it's not your own baby then the females are just they they're off the scale their brains just go wild when they hear the sound and the auditory signal goes to hearing crying baby they're off the charts you know and guys who have actually been fathers theirs reacts more than someone who's never been a father so there is a, there is an increase in in fatherhood that happens, but in the females it's like you know times twenty, in the males it may be like double. So there's a very that's that's you know just the the signaling to the brain of different kinds of things. There's these windows that that make us just per, that are, changes our perception, which I think is so cool that you can actually the things you can smell, the things you see, the things you hear, your auditory system can actually change based on these windows of like hormonal triggers. I mean, I know hormones are, the whole reason hormones exist is to cause a behavior, right? Hunger hormones make you hungry. Testosterone makes you want sex. You know, it's like the, the hormones are supposed to make you behave in a certain way. So it's always interesting when it does it. Yeah, I love that. And so it's like, um, there's that song from uh, that musical, um, I think it was the music man where um, I, I never heard the bird singing until, I, until there was you. And then uh, yeah. see things when like oxytocin is flowing through our system or testosterone and we don't perceive it another way. We're tuned to new things. That's really fascinating. All, all your, your explanations there. So yes, um, uh, viewers, we're talking today about the science of the female and male brains with Dr. Rita Valentino, the director of the division of neuroscience and behavior at the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health and Dr. Luann Brizendine, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco, author of The Female Brain, and also author of The Male Brain. Remember, please ask questions of our guests at any time. And uh, viewers, don't forget, we wanna hear from you. If you have questions uh, for either our guests, or if you wanna share about um, uh, what you've learned today, uh, please let um, people you know, know about this webcast. Uh, we'd love to uh, help have you spread the word about our webcast today if it's benefiting you. So um, Rita, let's turn back to you. We see that women the world over have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic uh, the, in terms of stress and depression and anxiety. Um, is that due to, we've talked about biological vulnerabilities, but are there also like um, cultural or coping styles uh, that differ between men and women that could be factor into this? So first off, this, the the pandemic has been probably the biggest stress experiment that we would ever see because you know everyone is exposed to this and so so understanding or seeing how different people um how uh, certain people are vulnerable certain people are are resistant we're really going to actually learn an incredible amount from this um as you i i think women are are disproportionately affected for a number of reasons. One is, as we, you know, we mentioned before, just the biological reasons that make them more sensitive to stress, but they're also primary caretakers. And so, you know, we're, this, you're, they're sitting at home, you know, taking care of kids that um, normally would be in school, trying to um, make sure they get their education. At the same time, they might be uh, working moms that are trying to balance this whole situation of uh, helping their kids, you know, with their education, and then also trying to uh, to, to deal with their work. And and uh, there's going to be a loss of women in the workforce because of this. And it, it's it's really uh, it's really a tragedy. And and the so yeah, it's it's it, I think it, it disproportionately affects them. Um, there, uh, we know that also uh, uh, other factors in uh, vulnerability to this crisis are going to be: um, Do you have social support, um, the environment, socioeconomic status? Do you have uh, access to health care, um, access to good quality health care? 
So uh, we know that that uh, this crisis is uh, really uh, that African Americans and Native Americans, that minority populations are, are incredibly vulnerable to this. Part of this is pre-existing health conditions, but also some of these socioeconomic conditions and access to health care as well. So there are a number of factors other than um, biological. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, coping. So, you know, it, just to go back to sort of animal experiments, we, we did some very, uh, uh, did some really interesting experiments on, on coping styles and how that changes the brain. And uh, in this particular experiment, we sort of had a, a, it was a social stress experiment where we have a bully rat, right? And we, we put a, a, a rat in the cage with the bully rat and, and, and the, what we call the intruder can have different kinds of coping styles. They can become subordinate, you know, go into the subordinate posture, like I give up, or they can kind of fight back. And what we found was that the guys that became uh, subordinate um, had a less effective um, uh, opioid, endogenous opioid stress coping system. So we have endogenous opioids in the brain that uh, kind of tone down the norepinephrine system, for example, and help the, the system recover when, uh, when after it's been activated by stress and when the stress is terminated, this is like a recovery system. So, so these coping styles, this subordinate coping style was associated with a less effective um, uh, endogenous opioid stress coping system, if you will. So, so coping is, 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 is very important and, and maybe training ways of coping can, uh, can be very helpful. It's fascinating to hear how this is intertwined between the biological and the cultural and how uh, culture can influence biology and vice versa. Speaking of culture and gender, um, here's a very important question. What does the new and evolving science on non-binary gender differences tell us? Uh, Luann and then, then Rita, I would love to hear from both of you, please. Well, this is a fascinating area. And, um, you know, I've, I've uh, been very interested for a long, long time in the transgender brain and, and the evolution of, of, of a gender identity disorder, so-called. <laughs> um, but, you know, so bottom line is, scientifically, we're in the very beginning of that. We don't know that much about them. It's not that much science. Uh, uh, there are not enough numbers that have, you know, but um, sort of interestingly, there've been some studies in Sweden that have looked at um, males who report being, uh, being female identity, um, even before they start to go through the transitions or take hormones or anything. And they've, they've tested them. The one thing they found that's, that's different is the, the female and male abilities to, to smell different pheromones that have to do with androstenedione, which is kind of a, an androgen that can make certain smells that you can't really quote unquote, they're not, they're not stinky or they don't smell, but they, they're pheromones that you kind of can waft over. And the, um, they, the males who, just, who are female identified gender wise actually have their smell system is more oriented towards females than, um, than, than males are that are identified as males. So there's, there's some biological differences that they're starting to pick up and they do those in the MRI scanner and they, they give them different smells or whatever. And they, they end up being triggered by the smells that are the pheromones that are usually um, only smelled by females and not by males. So, you know, the, we, we're finding subtle things that we can, pick out that are different. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the whole, um, the issue of, of what, how that testosterone and estrogen mix in the fetal, during your fetal life in utero is blended and how the receptors react or don't react. There's all kinds of layers of things that can be shifted a bit. That, that they're thinking about maybe, or have something to do with coming out, having the male body, right? The male, the, they have, having penis and testicles, um, male body, but, but basically having in, end up with female brain. Um, and there, there are various different things of being androgen receptor insensitive and variations on that, that are, that are thoughts about some of the, how this may end up happening. And it's one in 300. So it's, it's not, you know, the, the, um, the ratio, there's the, 
uh, something that's one in 300 humans is not exactly rare. I mean, something that's one in 50,000 humans is something that's rare. But so the one in 300 is um, not all that rare. I think everybody, everybody that I, I mean, I know lots of, of course, I know lots of transgender people who, because they come to me or they seek me out because of my work. Um, and so we don't know that much scientifically about it and, and where to, and, and where people fall on the spectrum. But the, the issue is, is it's, it's very individual. There can be many different factors. It's kind of like people who are able to see lots of colors. You know, it's uh, the factors about how someone ends up being female identified twins, for example. They've done a lot of studies on twins, both like as, you know, even identical twins, there have been some that have been split. And we don't, we don't have an idea how that happens. Rita may have some more hot off the press information about that. It's really, it's wonderfully interesting and exciting to know something about this because it talks a lot, not only about transgender or, or blended binary or, but it helps us also understand more about but what's more male and female. So it's fascinating, but Rita may have some more hot scientific I, stuff. I know. wish I had more insight. I think this is, you are, you hit the nail on the head with the, one of the first things you said, which is that this is a gap. This is a big uh, research gap that, that we need to uh, really begin to understand. At a basic science level, one of the ways that this has been investigated is with this, um, four core genotype model. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's uh, where you can have uh, a genetic sex. Uh, so you have you know, two genetic sex, but you can uh, switch the gonadal sex. So you can have a, an XX uh, with a, a, a gene that uh, causes the female to develop testes. So you can have a female that then you know, is gonna uh, have all this testosterone and, and uh, change the brain and, and you know, develop gonads and, um, in, in a male uh, uh, type manner. And then you can take the, that gene off the XY and have the male not expressing uh, testes and, and not expressing testosterone. So you can sort of separate out genetic sex from, um, from hormonal sex. And people have used that model to try to understand you know, what behaviors might be um, modulated more by genetic sex versus gonadal sex. So, so that's kind of a way that basic research has, has tried to address this question. But um, I think we sorry. need to, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. no, uh, I'm glad research is starting to address this question because it's an incredibly important social phenomenon that we're, we're yeah. um, experiencing world today and uh, more people are identifying as transgender or non-binary and uh, so I think it's, it would be great to understand that better. Um, so thanks for your uh, exposition on that. Um, Luann, um, do you have a new book coming out soon? It's called Upgrade? Yeah, it's called Upgrade? Due, six weeks it's due into the publisher so that you know that pushes the button for maybe maybe it'll be out in about nine months. So. <laughs> Enough yeah. time to build buzz perhaps but uh, oh, yeah. it's about the female brain remakes itself after menopause. Yeah. Uh, so the name of the book, the current title, working working title of the book is uh, The Upgrade, How the Female Brain Remakes Itself for the Better in the Second Half of Life. Uh-huh. Uh, that women age like kind of like 45 to 100. So. Perfect. And you know, no one has ever, there's the, 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 the medical terms for someone at that age are, you know, postmenopausal female. That's the name they give to that stage of life that lasts for 50 years. So I'm trying to take it apart and, and talk about it in different developmental stages along that way. Cause you know, there's many developmental stages but nobody's ever named those stages. They're just like, you know, oh, well, she's post fertility, not important, goodbye, whatever, you know. <laughs> so at any rate, so this book is all about the kind of the different developmental stages that we go through in the second half of life, right Rita? <laughs> right, yes. I, I Sign one for me. <laughs> I'm interested. I will. Yeah, it's actually it's exciting. It's a you know it's exciting timing. It's like all, all the medical research and stuff that you look at makes it look like it's a downgrade, not an upgrade. But um, I'm I'm happy to report that I think it's a big upgrade. <laughs> That's wonderful. Empowering women over over uh, after menopause and and in the the latter greatest stage of their life potentially um, when they can achieve the most. Um, so. Uh, Great, I can't wait to read it and to give it to women I know in my life. 
Thanks, um, Brandon. Luann and then Rita, what gives you optimism or hope about the future, about how gender brain differences will be viewed going forward and the potential benefits inherent in the ongoing research that you're, you and others are doing? Well, um, for me, um, and maybe because I'm in that second, second half of life now, you know, um, I just find that gender becomes less important in some ways. I mean, just, it's like, it's who you are, you know, who you are and how the, you know, the development of your, your soul, your spirit, who you are as a person, your authenticity, your ability to, to be less, uh, you know, you know, influenced by um, aspects of pigeonholing and stereotyping of gender. So interestingly enough, I sort of, I feel like some of my work has been, you know, the downside of it is it's kind of added to stereotypes. And um, I'm finding that I think that a lot of the hope of things is like that we get, we get out of the rut of stereotypes and we end up being able to, you know, talk about male and female and the hormones and the various things that, that make us who we are, but they don't limit us, you know, for who we are. It's just a part of understanding ourselves better as we go forward. So that's, that's kind of my hope for the future is that all of the, the gender differences that we're understanding will only contribute to our, you know, embracing our individuality. Because many of us know, like for example, supposedly males are better at navigation and finding their way places. So, well, I'm always the one who drives because I know where I don't need ways. I know my I have a map in my head about where I'm going. My poor husband, he's lived in San Francisco for 30 years and he still doesn't know how to drive to certain places downtown. <laughs> so, you know, the, you know, everybody has stories like that, right? So there's it's every person is an individual. So that that's kind of my hope for where this science is taking us. It's, it's, it's in an empowering direction for us as, as individuals. Wow, thank you. There's a poem by Mary Oliver where um, she talks about how uh, you'll be hearing voices about your who you're supposed to be throughout uh, much of your life. And then one day you're gonna hear your own voice and then you can kind of leave that behind, go your own way. I like that. Um, what about you, Rita? We hope that you'll hear your own voice and hear your own voice louder and louder as you, as you, as you get older. I think for women that's particularly true, since we kind of quiet our voices when we hit the teen years, and we have to refine our voices in the second half of life. You've definitely found your own voice, Luann, and we we love hearing it. Yeah. How about you, Rita? So I. Uh... As a basic scientist, I am very optimistic uh, for the future because we are we're in a time where we are learning so much about the brain so fast. At, at uh, you know at NIH we have um, the Brain Initiative, which is developing these tools that are allowing us to really understand um, from from molecule to you know whole brain network how the brain works to, to do all the processes it does to, to make decisions, to, to have emotions. And uh, it's really accelerated uh, our ability to understand uh, what the brain is doing. And with that understanding, it's helping us to understand not only differences between male and female, but um, you know, as Luann brought out, individual different. What makes us an individual? How do genes, hormones interact with our prior experiences, our uh, social interactions, the drugs we've taken, um, every, invite our whole environment. You know, how, how do these things all kind of converge and shape our brain to make us the individual that we are? And, and once we have that information, We'll be able to understand, you know, why certain people are vulnerable to particular diseases, but also to develop treatments for not just one sex or the other, but treatments that are tailored to individuals in a very precise manner. So it really gives me a, a lot of uh, optimism. Yeah, what a great day that'll be when people can uh, receive care that will be tailored directly to their, their personal needs as individuals and, and uh, help them achieve their goals in their lives. Um, I think that's what care ought to be. So great. Well, thanks for, for thanks for uh, both to both of you for offering your wisdom and expertise and insights today. And Anthony, thank you again for your wonderful performance. Uh, viewers, thank you for watching and participating today. Uh, if you have further questions you'd like to post, uh, 
please, please, please feel free to post them on onemind.org slash brainwaves. Thanks everybody and have a wonderful day. Mental health is stepping out of the shadows and into the spotlight. I think I need help. Can you talk? Struggling. I'm here. Depressed. Can't sleep. But we need the science and solutions to change lives. Now, more than ever, we are in this fight together. We are of one mind. Accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org.